Hello again. Welcome back to the accompanying videos for the Back to Basics um, tutorial. This is the third of those on multiple sequence alignment. Just for completeness, we should cover why we want to get a multiple sequence alignment. And um, I guess the main reason is that that gives you something that you can use to compare uh, individuals. So to compare sequences, you have to know um, which parts of the sequences um, are comparable. So we can use sequence alignment to identify complex relationships uh, amongst multiple species that way, uh, much more than just um, pairwise comparisons. Um, we can use multiple sequence alignment to find homologous parts that could be uh, particular sites, particular locations in um, a chromosome, um, particular base pairs in the gene, in sequences that might be under, say, different selection dynamics. And of course, we use it to build phylogenetic trees. And multiple sequence alignment essentially is a, is a required step in molecular phylogenetics. We have to do this before we can do molecular phylogenetics. So let's think about the sequence alignment problem. And this is actually one of the best understood and best solved bioinformatics problems. It's, it's how to align two sequences. So let's see how we solve that. And uh, to do that, we need to know what an alignment really is and how to judge whether an alignment is say good or whether it's bad and talk about algorithms to find uh, good alignment because we don't want to do this manually. So what's an alignment? Well, given two sequences, uh, like these ones here, so D, D, G, A, C, T, D, arbitrarily chosen, and this second short sequence, an alignment is essentially a mapping of their positions, uh, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, to a common ordering by inserting gaps in one sequence or another. And that is so that we can identify sites that are homologous, homologous meaning that they share the same evolutionary history. So their history is the same as the species uh, history for these, these taxa of interest. So it's the same branching order and the, the, and the same pattern overall. So that would be an alignment or could be an alignment for these two sequences here. You can think of uh, identifying homologous sites or loci in molecular sequences as a little bit like tracing the origin of a of a set of transcribed documents that have been meticulously copied from document to document um, through all of those copies back to the original um, and the individual words for example the first word in each copy would be homologous even if perhaps it's been copied with some error and so I think that's a reasonable analogy. Once we've identified those homologous sites, and that means uh, nucleotides or amino acids in this case, then we can analyze their differences and similarities under some kind of evolutionary model. And we need that uh, as it's a central part of phylogenetic analysis. And in, in fact, it's part of all comparative analysis if you have molecular sequences. So we absolutely have to have homologous uh, items things that have the same shared history in order to compare them properly. So we can imagine sequences uh, evolving on the tree, which I hope will be illustrative of the different processes that can lead to similarities and differences between sequences. So here I've got an eight base sequence at the root, ACGT, ACGT, and we can imagine that it's evolved on this tree. We'll just go through some of the changes that have that may have occurred to account for, to account for the differences. So we've got an A to G substitution happening on this branch at, at the first position. We have a, a deletion of the first T at, at position four. So I've just represented that by a gap. Uh, on this branch, we've got an insertion of two Ts uh, towards the end. So here they are. In this branch, I've got an A to G substitution, first position, which is a, a parallel change, but it's independent of this substitution as well. It's worth noting these, just because they're the same doesn't mean to say, say that it was the same event. On this branch, I've got an insertion 
of a T and it is right at the beginning. On this branch, I've got two substitutions, T to G. Um, we don't have to have just one uh, modification happening to a sequence on a branch. And of course, the longer the branch, the more chance there is for more modification. So in this case, we've got two T to G substitutions. I have one uh, at the very end and one there, position four. So they change there, there. Uh, and I've got C to A substitution. Where's that? Uh, C to A, C to A substitution on that branch. And this last branch, I've both got a deletion of the T at the end and an A to C substitution down there. So you can see that after, for example, a substitution happens, and that's carried on through all of the descendants. After a deletion happens, that's carried on through all of the descendants. So this group of sequences, these two sequences here, having that deletion is as a result of the deletion in their common ancestor. And likewise for all of the other changes. So unless a change is then modified, um, it will um, persist through that whole play. So gaps don't remain in the sequences. We don't see them. Um, we need to reconstruct where they would be. Um, and we only have these uh, sequences in, the, uh, in our data set uh, at the end. We need to align them uh, and try and figure out where the insertion and deletion events happen. So this is a completely faked um, result of me knowing what the history was. And this is the true alignment um, of, of what actually um, took place in the history of these sequences. Um, this alignment could be a reasonable explanation as well, though. If we go back, we can see in the first one, we've got a number of um, columns where there are some substitutions. We have some largely conserved columns, not very many actually. Um, and we've got some gaps that sort of line up. And in the sequences one, two, and five, we have, um, um, it looks like according to the, the pattern of the gaps, maybe three and four actually should go together and one and two and five should be in a different clay. Maybe, maybe that's what's going on to explain those differences. Um, alternatively, this might also be a reasonably good looking alignment. Um, it has similar, reasonably well conserved columns. Uh, it has a slightly different pattern of gaps, um, though. And here I've got a single insertion or a deletion of one base pair long versus in this sequence. And that's for the, for the four sequences, one, two, three, four. And for sequence five, it's of length four and overlapping. So maybe that's not such a great um uh alignment um and having said that if that's a reasonable alignment then so is this uh and you really couldn't tell the difference between them if you were trying to choose what the correct alignment is it wouldn't actually make any difference to a phylogenetic method um those two are equally good uh this is a terrible alignment for those data it has one thing that it does well, which is to, apart from this last but one column where I've missed it, it's lined up almost every column with only matches and no mismatches apart from that last one there, which I missed. And everything else is gaps. And so, um, sure, you could have that, but it's a terrible nonsensical alignment because the indels make no sense at all as having come from a single um, phylogenetic history from a single tree. They're all over the place. So that, that would be a terrible alignment. Um, so let's have a little bit of a look at how you might identify some of those issues in an alignment that you do and how you might fix them. So let's look at the first um, position here, uh, position one sort of this, these two columns, really, you can see that there's a gap in all of the sequences, but it's sort of not lined up. Um, and that's a problem because it doesn't sort of make sense that you would have an insertion or deletion event in some sequences, then at the next 
base position have another event in the other sequences. So it's just so unlikely. It makes much more sense that this might simply be a substitution A to C or C to A somewhere on the tree. Um, so that's that's a sign that maybe something's gone wrong. Uh, and at position two, we have these other gaps that have been inserted and they just don't line up. But even though they're not across all of the sequences, they probably should line up. And so it makes more sense um, probably to have this um, gap here in the third sequence actually lined up with the others. And so um, we can imagine fixing that alignment as follows. So these are just two sort of chunks of a toy example. And on the first chunk there on the left, I've removed that gap throughout. And on the second chunk, I've moved the gap so that they line up because they've, they have phylogenetic meaning. They should line up to a point. So it becomes a bit of a balancing act. You have to balance the number of gaps with a number of mismatches. You have to recognize that, for example, this is a dreadful alignment that you can't really use for phylogenetics. Um, this has a problem in it that it's got a gap essentially that could be removed at the expense of having another substitution. And this um, problem here we just mentioned, you could sort of line up the gaps to be more phylogenetically appropriate. Um, so this balancing act is between the number of gaps and number of mismatches. And you should really be um, used to checking when there are insertions or deletions that simply don't make sense. They don't, don't correspond to a shared history of the um, surrounding homologous sites. Uh, particular when there are other alternative arrangements that do. So that was the case for this second block here. There was an alternative arrangement that actually did fit with a phylogenetic history relating these sequences. So now we've got a good sense of what a good alignment might look like. Um, it doesn't make sense for us to align all of our sequences by hand. It's going to take a long time we should know roughly how automatic methods do sequence alignment. And we're going to start with pairwise sequence alignment because that is something that is well solved. And through this um, dynamic programming um, approach, dynamic programming is a very broad method of solving problems. We can optimally solve the pairwise alignment problem. That means we can get a globally optimal uh, alignment given two sequences, which is terrific. To know whether an alignment is a good alignment for this optimality to work, we then have to have some sense of what sequences are similar or dissimilar. And um, there are different sorts of uh, gauges as to whether sequences are similar or not. We'll talk about really just two of them. The main ones we sequence dissimilarity, simply counting the number of differences between two sequences. And the other edit cost is a measure of how much evolutionary work has to be done to turn one sequence into another. Bearing in mind, of course, that when we're aligning two extant sequences, sequences that exist now in time, we're not really thinking about how one of these extant sequences was turned into the other, so much as how their how much common how much work there was from their common ancestor to these two extant sequences. It's not from an extant sequence to another extant sequence. It's how much work was done to go from their common ancestor to the two of them. We'll also think about. Uh, or we could think about likelihood for measuring how different two sequences are. We won't cover that now, but this is often part of phylogenetic analysis that you'll come to later. So the simplest of these measures of sequence dissimilarity is called the Hamming distance, uh, named after a mathematician called Hamming. Um, and this is simply the number of differences between two sequences. So we can imagine we've got this very small alignment here. And this is the best we've got. And the number of 
mismatches or well, the mismatched sites I've just highlighted with an asterisk. Um, mismatch uh, when two nucleotides differ from each other or with a gap. They're all the same. They all count one. And so the Hamming distance for this, these two sequences, these two aligned sequences, is five because there are five mismatches. That gives us a p value or proportion, not a statistical p value, a p distance of five out of the 20 bases long for the whole sequences, so 0.25. A more sophisticated way of doing it is to think about the edit cost, and that's the amount of evolutionary work that needs to be done to turn one sequence into another, bearing in mind it's from a common ancestor. And we might come up with some kind of edit cost matrix like this. And this matrix is a five by five matrix. It includes all the costs are going between two character, uh, nucleotide characters and between uh, a gap and a nucleotide. And in this way, we can summarize the different relative rates or how common or uncommon each of these uh, substitutions or changes might be between, say, a nucleotide and a gap or a nucleotide and another nucleotide. We don't have a gap to gap cost. That just doesn't make sense. So that's why it's an NA. And in this same example, we would then score it slightly differently. G to T, G to C, and C to G all have cost one. A to G has an amount of work given cost two, so it's more work, less common. And uh, a gap costs five. And this high gap score reflects the idea that gaps are much less common um, between sequences than uh, substitutions. Now, gaps are a little bit more complicated than simply um, nucleotide versus gap, adjacent nucleotide versus gap, because in biology, there's both the process of having a gap and the process of having a longer gap, extending the gap. That corresponds to the idea that it's a certain um, process involved in having an insertion or a deletion event, and then something else happens to determine how long that insertion or deletion event is. And we can model that using um, two parameters, a gap opening penalty and a gap extension penalty. And those are uh, actually as complicated as we can get and still use this fast process called dynamic programming to solve the pairwise alignment problem. Um, if you want to get any more complicated and have perhaps a likelihood-based approach to account for different um, gap lengths, insertion or deletion lengths, perhaps based on empirical data, then we would have to use heuristics, which we won't cover here. Um, it's beyond the scope of this tutorial but they do exist to have a more uh, sophisticated method of comparing sequences using likelihood. It's worthwhile noting how many alignments there are. And this sort of scary looking table on the right is how many alignments there are when the sequences are just of length 10 when you allow for there being some gaps. So for just two sequences, it's quite a large number, uh, 184,000, 185,000. For three sequences, it's much, much worse, 10 to the 12. And you can see as the number of sequences grows, this number grows very, very fast. And for 10 sequences, just of length 10, uh, 2.35 by 10 to the 92, which is the more than the number of particles in the known universe. So it's a lot of alignments and we're not going to be able to guarantee an optimal alignment. So how does dynamic programming work with us just two sequences? Well, in general, dynamic programming works by imagining that you can optimally solve a slightly smaller problem and then extend the slightly smaller problems to a slightly larger problem. And ultimately, if you can do that, if your problem has that sort of structure, then you can optimally solve the full problem. So in 
sequence alignment, this corresponds to starting off with very trivial alignments and sort of just extending them base by base or amino acid by amino acid uh, to ultimately make the complete uh, and globally optimal alignment. And it's fast. Dynamic programming is pretty fast and we'll explain how fast it is in, in a few minutes. So you can imagine that dynamic programming has this sort of structure. We might start with a very trivial initial solution. And for sequence alignment, that would be we have aligned nothing. We started at both of our sequences and we stay at position zero. So we know that the optimal solution to that is just nothing. The only possible solution. Further down the track, we can imagine that we've got an optimal partial solution to a slightly smaller problem, perhaps where one sequence ends at position um, uh, I minus one and the other sequence ends at position J. And we want to solve the problem for the sequences that end at position I and position J. So one more base in one sequence. Or we might have a partial solution where we've got to position i in one sequence and j minus one in the other. We want to get to this next partial solution where it's both sequences go to i and to j. And the other possibility is that we, we have an optimal solution for sequences, for the first sequence up to position i minus one, a second one up to position j minus one, and then we want to get the optimal solution for positions i and j. That might be a little bit difficult to follow. And so we've got a slightly um uh, simple example to indicate what I'm getting on uh, about there. So we can imagine in one situation, perhaps this is where I've solved this problem. I've solved this two sequences that end ACG and ACG. The next base in the first sequence is a T and the next base in the second sequence is also a T. I would advance both sequences and end up with my alignment ending ACGT in both. Another option might be that I've solved the previous uh, problem and the two sequences just ended up AC and ACG. My next base in both sequences is a T and so my optimal solution would be to add a gap in one sequence, line up the two T's and um, that would be my optimal solution uh, for positions I and J from the previous slide. And the third option would be that uh, I insert a gap in the second sequence to line up my next two bases. This might uh, be perhaps illustrated for further clarity in this little diagram here. And this is where the what's called the dynamic programming table comes in or the um, array, dynamic programming array. And we can imagine that we've solved these previous problems, ending in X and Y, X and Y, X and Y. And then we either go from, I can't highlight that. So X and Y over here where my cursor is, and then advance both sequences to two new bases. Or I might find that my best solution comes from the best solution found at this point and then adding a gap in one sequence. Or but my third option, I might find that my optimal solution comes from uh, the optimal solution in this cell of the table, followed by adding a gap in the other sequence. So at each point in my filling in my table, which I'll illustrate in a moment, we go, we check against the cells above to the left, and above left and look at the score that that alignment has, that solution has in each of those three cells and add a score for what happened next. So in this, in this scenario, if I come from this upper left corner, I have no gap. That means that the score I add is going to correspond to putting W next to Z. And in the, if I come from the above cell, the score I add is going to correspond to adding a gap in one sequence. And oh, 
plus the optimal score at that point. And the third option is I take the optimal score from that one and I add a gap cost. So the minimum of those, if I'm minimizing the, total, the, the cost, or the maximum, if I'm maximizing a cost, um, is selected. And I keep a note of where I got that optimal solution. Let's illustrate that with an uh, example. And this is an example of amino acids. I've got two small amino acid sequences here, X and Y. And for amino acids, we know quite a lot about the relative frequency in which they occur in homologous sequences. And this is a score function in this matrix where a high score corresponds to uh, the pair of amino acids being found to be homologous very often. So you'll frequently find a W uh, against the W at the same homologous position in amino acid sequences. It's much less common to find an E aligned with a G in as a homologous amino acid. Generally speaking, when it's uh, the same amino acid, it's positive. And when it's different amino acid, it's negative. But you can see that some are found to be more conserved, like the W is very much more conserved than the H or the E or, or the A. And I don't think there are any in which uh, it's... I've just filled in all of the costs. So we've got a repeat of the E, e cost in here. I don't think there are any in which putting a, an amino acid uh, next to itself is negative, but perhaps there are somewhere. We're going to use these edit costs to fill in the table. The table gets filled in from the top left corner down to the right hand bottom corner. And when we reach the bottom corner, then we will have had, we will have traversed both sequences, going only to the right and down uh, and diagonally. And we'll end, we, this will be the score of the optimal sequence. So this is um, the process of filling in once we fill in. And at each cell, here, just to remind you what happens, say at this cell here, minus six, the optimal score is minus six, and that's going to have come from uh, the um, maximum of minus 10 plus a score for a gap. So minus 10 plus, it was minus five, it would be minus 15, or minus two plus another minus five for a gap, because it's horizontal. Uh, which would be minus seven, or minus five plus the score for putting E with P, sorry, minus five plus the score for putting E with P, which is, I think, minus one. You can check back here, E with P, minus one. And so the best solution for the problem aligning these two tiny sequences, H, E with P, is to start with a gap and then align the E with the P. And that's how you can interpret that. So we don't keep track of the alignment as we go. We just keep track of where we've come from. So ultimately, when we've finished filling in the table and we've made note of where we've come from from each of these um, in each of these cells, then we end up with a whole lot of back arrows. Um, and that's what I've drawn on here. So or this is the forward direction, and then when we get to the end, we backtrack, and this gives us the alignment. It's a bit awkward to go backwards, but we can imagine that the once we have that path, that path from the top left-hand corner down to the bottom right-hand corner is the alignment, because we can read that off straight away. We have a gap in the first sequence, and then we have going from uh, the H, uh, through to the E, and then we go down to matching A with the P, and then we go along and we have a gap, and then we match the A with the A, which makes sense, and the W with the W, which makes sense, um, and then all the way down. 
every time we move diagonally, this is a match. And every time we move horizontally or vertically, it's a gap. And there's our result. We can have the A with the P, A with the W, A with the W, H, H, E, 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 E. And the total cost of the alignment is 16. So that's what happens in the background so that you don't have to do it. Now, this approach is really, really general. Um, this um, method of doing pairwise sequence alignment. There's some varieties that work um, for different circumstances, such as the Needleman Wunsch uh, version is used for local alignment. It's a simple adaptation of this general process. And that means finding the best match of one sequence in another sequence. In, any, in fact, any part of one sequence in any part of another sequence. Very clever. It works exactly the same way, but with some additional costs. Uh, Smith-Waterman is the one we've really just shown. That's used for global alignment when you want to find the best alignment of all of one sequence with all of another sequence. You can also adapt it to find the longest match of um, perfect matches um, between one sequence and another. I think in our case, it would only be two, but you would set it up um, by simply assigning different costs. You might be interested to know that BLAST uses this system. Once it's found good matching pairs, it extends the alignments um, to find the full uh, sequence match or, or alignment between, say, a query sequence and a target sequence. And I should just mention that the affine GAT scores are a sort of another generalization of this approach um, we used here where in fact you add another layer to this table um, to allow for a gap opening and closing in one sequence or the other. We won't go into that here, but that's as complicated as this gap. So I've said it has some nice properties. I said it's fast. Well, fast in quotes. Um, it's fast in the sense that it's a polynomial of the lengths of the sequences. So it's this all comes down to this table. If you think about this table, it's got some number of operations per cell, and the number of cells is about the length of one sequence times the number of, times the length of the other. So in computer science speak, we would say that this is order n m if the sequences of the sequence the lengths of the sequences are n and m. If they're about the same, we'd just say it's n squared. So it's quadratic in sequence length. This is fine. Uh, the amount of space is also quadratic in N. There's um, other versions which make minor adjustments to these, but you don't really see them in practice. The solution is globally optimal. That's really good to know. It means that whatever solution this is, you are guaranteed that it will have the best possible cost or best possible score. It doesn't mean that there's only one um, globally optimal alignment, but it will definitely give you one of the global, globally optimal alignments. The problem, of course, is that if you have more sequences, you can imagine how you might do that, you would have a bigger table. And as the size of the table increases, to say K sequences, you'd have order n to the power of K, so n cubed, n to the four, n to the five, and so on. That scary table I mentioned before, uh, comes in here. And it's also worth noting that the number of operations per cell goes up exponentially in the number of sequences. So it's pretty bad. It's not practical. We can't do it for more than two sequences, so we don't. What do we do for multiple sequence alignment? Well, we have to use heuristics, and heuristics are methods that will give you a reasonably good solution, but don't ever have a guarantee that it's the optimal solution. So we go from guaranteed optimal solutions for pairwise alignment to no guarantees for multiple sequence alignment. We still use pairwise alignment. Um, it's a crucial part of multiple sequence alignment. And um, in fact, the most famous uh, program that does multiple sequence alignment probably is Clustal, and that uses pairwise alignment throughout. Just does it pairwise alignments of alignments of alignments. And we'll see a little bit how that works, but we won't go into too much detail because it's a little bit beyond the scope of this tutorial. There are lots and lots of 
good sequence alignment methods out there. Plastel does progressive alignment, as do some others. The pro process is quite simple. Um, for Plastel, you align all the pairs of sequences to start with using dynamic programming. From that alignment, from all of those pairwise alignments, because you've got a similarity measure, or say an edit cost to go between two sequences, you can create a distance matrix. And distance matrix allows you to construct a tree. And so that's the next stage. From a distance matrix, you form a guide tree, which is sometimes built in the same way as you build a phylogenetic tree, but it's not intended to be a phylogenetic tree. So you probably shouldn't regard it as that. Uh, it's really only to guide the order in which you do the pairwise alignments and alignments of alignments. So you then, using this guide tree, you progressively align pairs of sequences, pairs of aligned sequences, alignments, using dynamic programming. It's a bit more complicated um, when you have um, an alignment of an alignment, but again, it's still the same principle. We still do the same things. It's just that you need to take into account that an alignment is a bit more complicated than uh, a sequence. But ultimately, it comes down to the same sort of process. Clustal isn't actually that great. Um, I mentioned that there are a whole lot of really good alignment methods out there. Um, and with muscle, tea, coffee, um, mat, and uh, this is by no means an exhaustive list. Currently, my favorites are muscle uh, and mat. Muscle tends to run a bit slower than mat, but very similar output. And, and that's for the case where you have a lot of sequences. It's comparable otherwise. Uh, and mat is what we use on uh, for this tutorial and is installed on Galaxy. So a little bit about mat. Um, this is a direct quote from there. Uh, from the homepage for MAFT. There's a, a URL at the bottom there. Uh, offers a various multiple alignment strategies. This is definitely the case, classified into progressive, such as Clustal, an iterative refinement method using WSP. So WSP is the weighted sum of pairs, which essentially just sums the similarities between all of the pairs in the alignment and uses that as a score for how good the whole alignment is. And there's uh, further methods, iterative refinement using both WSP and other methods, so-called consistency scores. And those are all trade-offs between speed and accuracy. The fastest methods, of course, are gonna be less accurate. This is a bit of an overview about roughly how MAFT works. Uh, interestingly, the first uh, set of the varieties of MAFT, um, on the left here, use a distance matrix not derived from pairwise alignments, but from the number of shared six tuples. So you can imagine that each sequence is broken into short words of length six overlapping as you move along the sequence. And you can ask, how often does this particular six tuple in one sequence occur in the other sequence? It's a very quick measure. It's not as accurate as doing a pairwise alignment, which the second set of methods do, but it's very fast and for many purposes is adequate. From that distance matrix, you construct a guide tree, you do the pro progressive alignment, and then you can reconstruct the guide tree from the alignment. So it's a two-stage process. You do the guide tree, you align, and that gives you a an alignment from which you can make a guide tree, which means you can go back. So after one um, um, iteration of this process, you just stop. And that's for these flavors here, the FFT, NS1, NS2. And an alternative is you keep going and you keep iteratively refining until you can make no more improvement for these other varieties here. And the other one, the more um, sophisticated starting point is when you do all the pairwise alignments, just as Clustal does, you do the progressive alignment, and then in um, you can have you can stop there for these varieties, or you can keep going and refine and refine and refine 
using the weighted sum of pair score and a program called Coffee, beyond the scope of this tutorial. But they're out there and the documentation as to which is appropriate for different kinds of data sets is on Galaxy. So let's have a quick look at an example. Um, this is from the Anolis data that we are using in the tutorial. I'm using a program called CView, which I have installed on my own computer. It runs on everything. It looks a bit 80s, um, and it is, but it's what we have. And it allows you to do something that MAPS doesn't, which is to manipulate the alignment once it's been made. I've scrolled along my alignment to, I don't know if you can see, position 956 at the very left-hand side of this alignment, this very 80s colored alignment. Um, I'm interested in an area a little bit further along around site 982 and following by a few bases, so where the little arrow is. And you might be able to see, I hope you can, that there's what appears to be an insertion of length two in actually every sequence right over here about a third of the way across in uh, Anolis vermiculatus there's a, a two base pair insertion and then all the way down in every sequence you can see there's a couple of bases that have been inserted and this looks like a case where the alignment method has actually made a mistake it's inserted something that it probably shouldn't have and this will be a res as a result of inappropriate costs for gaps versus substitutions and it's avoided substitutions but it's given us gaps that aren't uh, realistic so i've now gone through and i won't demonstrate it but i've um, recently just gone through and aligned all of those sequences in c view you can do this by um, clicking and dragging and key commands and now those two bases are all lining up and of course i don't need that insertion of two bases in every single sequence anymore it's all matching up at the same position so i can delete that and so just delete it like that um, that's also a function that you can do in c view but i won't go into the details so clearly that's an error that was made in the automatic alignment um, which we can fix it's always a good idea to go back and check your alignment just to make sure that there aren't any obvious errors in it that you can address i will point now at a point about a little bit more than halfway across where my arrow is there's also a little bit of disagreement maybe between reality and what i don't know and and, and what the alignment is suggesting this agga motif very tiny, the red, yellow, yellow, red. Looks like it probably should be a homologous motif, a pattern that is really is homologous and shared across all the species. Almost every sequence has it, but it's been moved around a bit. So that might be something that you want to address. And you can also see that this is very, this is a recurring theme in the rest of the alignment as well where my arrow, arrow is, hope you can see that we've got one sequence slightly shifted along relative to the others. You can see that kink in the vertical patterns of colors, another kink down here. And then it's very obvious over towards the far right as well. It's a blue, red, green pattern, TAG, and that's out of alignment all the way down. And that is probably as a result of a misalignment from the program so at this point you would want to go back and, and fix that if you're using your alignment uh, in uh, phylogenetic analysis on galaxy you would have to download it run c view and check for these issues fix those and then re-upload it uh, and then continue your analysis and it probably would make a big difference once you've done your alignment then you can use it for phylogenetic analysis, which is fantastic. You can derive distances from uh, a good alignment and you can use likelihood analyses as well. And that'll be the next thing we start with. So what's next? Building trees from distances and um, 
that'll do for now. Thank you very much.